Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In lecture numbered 8, we will move ahead from where we left in the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we delved into phenomenology and ethnometrology. We tried to underline the significant aspects that help in understanding the nature and scope of social sciences in the aftermath of positivist dispute. With the details from phenomenology and ethnometrology, we understood that there is a possibility of engaging with subjective experiences. However, that engagement itself amounts to development of a methodological framework. In addition to these two signposts that is phenomenology and ethnomethodology, there are, there are other equally important signposts sociology of knowledge, hermeneutics, feminist epistemology and something which is called social construction of reality approach kind of constructivism which informed by phenomenology delves deeper into the structures of common sense world. We will make a sketchy foray into some of these in order to develop a synoptic view. The social scientists have noted that the post positivist ways of seeing hinges a great deal on hermeneutic tradition. It however does not mean that positivism did not derive anything from hermeneutic philosophy and we will get to see that. Parthanath Mukherjee a sociologist helps in understanding that the social scientists become similar to social hermes while following hermeneutic philosophy. Who were the Hermes? Hermes were known as messengers of gods in Greek tradition whose objective was to deliver the biblical interpretation of the hidden meanings in the scriptures. And with the enlightenment about which we have had discussion in the previous lectures, with that enlightenment movement of philosophical churning, the hermeneutic philosophers shifted the Hermes attention from the biblical, biblical scripture to human world in order to interpret meanings that occupy human world. Quoting Delanti about the role of hermeneutic tradition Parthanath Mukherjee notes that apart from factoring in psychologism, hermeneutics provided a romantic critique of rationalist enlightenment philosophy. It centered cult of feeling by decentering cult of reason and in the same fashion it underlined subjectivity, cultural essentialism and production of meanings as the important features of human world. Two broad char characteristics are found within hermeneutics. Objectivism that prevailed among German neo-Kantians such as Max Weber's sociology and also in Sigmund Freud's psychoanalysis their preoccupation with an objective approach to meaning. 
they narrowed down on objective meanings while dealing with the subjective experiences. The second characteristic of hermeneutic tradition as it appears in social sciences is that other than objectivism is its, is its counterpart that is subjectivism. Subjectivism was decisive in the philosophical works of Martin Heidegger, Hans George Gad Gadamer, Peter Winch and so and so forth. These philosophers were more or less in unanimity despite variation in their respective intellectual tra trajectories. They were in unanimity in emphasizing the significance of cultural context in the production of meanings. The hermeneutic philosophy is one can say a walk away from Kantian distinction of noumena, the reality accessible to pure reason different from phenomena that is the domain of scientific knowledge. We are aware that Max Weber broke away from the hermeneutic tradition and thereof divide between the two domains of knowledge, the divide which was held steadfast by some of the contemporaries of Max Weber such as Rickert and Windelband. They tried to perpetuate that divide. We are aware of this debate Weber had with economists and historians on value neutrality of social sciences. Some of these things were discussed in the previous lectures. As an objectivist, Weber differed from his colleagues who were of the view that social science can be divided into ideographic and nomothetic parts. Ideographic dealing with the notions, ideas, feelings and experiences whereas nomothetic dealing with only facts. But this ought to be noted that like Weber within hermeneutic philosophy Dilthe adopted a more objectivist approach to meaning and so did Freud in psychoanalysis. Whereas the famously known linguistic turn in hermeneutics was a turn to subjectivism too. Heidegger and Wittgenstein who made reality to appear as linguistically constituted and context bound, they were the ones who primarily accomplished this linguistic turn. The linguistic turn was loaded with subjectivism of the philosophers who intended to show the subjectivist nature of human experience and knowledge appeared as an essentially subjective entity. This is indeed sharply opposite to the preoccupation with objectivity which was common to both a part of hermeneutic philosophy as well as positivism. And in this line of subjectivist hermeneutics as it were, Gadamer is one of the most discussed philosophers. About Gadamer, there was there were some references in the previous lecture. Gadamer with his work Truth and Method tried to subvert the whole scientific approach to truth claim. He tried to bring back the category of prejudice considering that the biggest prejudice of natural sciences, the biggest prejudice in built in scientific epistemology is the claim that science is prejudice free. He considered that the claim to be value neutral is actually one of the most value loaded claims that scientific epistemology upholds and thereby he turned to all those things 
which would be misfit in scientific epistemology. He considered it important for philosophers to engage with prejudices. The idea was not to merely unmask prejudices in order to trash them. The idea was to evaluate those prejudices and develop an argument on informed by those prejudices, develop an argument in favor of this evaluative mechanism which can lead a seeker of knowledge in pursuit of meaning to arrive at a fairer understanding of those prejudices. It is important also to acknowledge that a field of sociology began to be seriously discussed since the early 1930s. Again, this is the time when phenomenology, interest in phenomenology comes into existence. This is the time when interest in criticizing, critically revisiting scientific epistemology came into existence with Karl Popper. It is quite a fecund time, quite fertile moment in the intellectual history of social sciences, 1930s. This is the time when Karl Mannheim published Ideology and Utopia. We have discussed briefly Karl Mannheim's work in earlier lecture. Mannheim's work outlined the nature and scope of sociology of knowledge. The basic tenets of Mannheim's detailed thesis was flagged in previous lecture. This thesis was on the relation of knowledge and socio-cultural context, suffice to say this at, at this moment. This thesis was an anticipation of a post-positivist way, in a way much before the controversy about science and positivism broke out. We had also noted earlier that the participants in the positivist dispute were not very comfortable with sociology of knowledge. Adorno and Popper and later participants were nearly in consensus that sociology of knowledge paves the way for epistemological relativism. The idea of contextual knowledge was in a way supportive of relative knowledge in the perspective of the critiques. Though Mannheim's thesis emphasized relationism rather than relativism. Despite this, we shall note that the study of Weltanschauungen, which would in English mean life world. This interest in life world is a common interest for Mannheim, Mannheim's sociology of knowledge, for Schuh's, Alfred Schuh's phenomenology, for Garfinkel, Harold Garfinkel's ethnomethodology. The preoccupation with life world appears in the later responses of the Frankfurt School too. Habermas, for example, was very keen to unearth, un, uh, uh, unravage the finer nuances of life world and it was followed by a critical resurrection of the hermeneutic philosophy in sociology. This all leads to what has been pithily termed as anti-foundational thought, which was also discussed in the previous lecture. This anti-foundation is indicative of a methodological approach. It shapes way of seeing in ultimate analysis very suitable for what we have been discussing as post-positivist social science. Since we have touched upon the idea of anti-foundational methodology in social science in the previous lecture, we will not go into the detail. Instead, we would move ahead and we try to understand some other signposts, primarily in this lecture, feminist epistemology and its engagement with the question of science and the kind of approach that begins to surface from feminist standpoint theories, a crucial component of feminist epistemology. 
while there could be a sense of departure and negotiation in the post positivist sociology in this part of lecture we shall we shall bring forth the epistemological interventions in science and sociology from what has been termed as the feminist standpoint theory the theoretical debate since early 1980s starts with the realization that various waves of women's movement and feminist activism notwithstanding feminism is an epistemological field too the various interventions on feminist standpoint theory are testimonial to not only epistemological bearings of feminist activism and women's movement across globe but also shapes up ways of seeing in social science in general and sociology in particular the feminist epistemology is truly in proximity with feminist politics and thereby the body of knowledge which emerges from it resounds the political concerns of the of the feminist scholars it also persuades us to join in a very different kind of intellectual politics as it has been flagged throughout the lectures methodology is a field of intellectual politics performed by scholars from different disciplinary background meanwhile the consequence of the variety within feminist epistemology also amounts to suggesting that there cannot be one feminist standpoint this was most systematically put in the famous quintessential work of sandra harding sandra harding's the science question in feminism offers us at least three components of feminist epistemology a feminist empiricism b feminist standpoint theory and c feminist postmodernism instead of putting each separately what we are doing in the following part of lecture is that we try to engage with the enmeshed material that serves feminist epistemology better we look at feminist standpoint theory since that enables us to get into the methodological aspects more resoundingly so in one variety of the feminist point theory we notice some of those things which are familiar to us by now this variety of feminist standpoint theory operates with a curious dichotomy about which we would not be any more curious as we get to know the detail of the di dichotomy and what is this dichotomy on one hand it has abstract world of science abstract world conjured meticulously created factually supported by scientific epistemology which is inclined allegedly inclined to masculine ruling class and oppressors this is one part of the dichotomy the second part of the dichotomy offers us a concrete world this is a concrete world of feminist epistemology this concrete world created by feminist epistemology about which feminist epistemology discusses is inclined to women's lived experience and and everyday life it is in this part of feminist epistemology that lived experience category of lived experience in the framework of everyday life becomes central while this dichotomy is the strength of this theory it also delimits its outreach particularly in the face of questions arising from 
post postmodern way of thinking postmodern approach to social reality feminist standpoint theory seems to be responding to some of those questions which are very typical of postmodernism post structuralism and also epistemological relativism to begin with let's engage with nancy hartsock adopting a social constructionist perspective rooted in marxian historical materialism nancy hartsock set an idea in 1975 about the possibility of developing a methodological approach to life and politics the methodological approach was also to comprehend critically comprehend the dualistic structure of reality in which oppressor and oppressed stand on two sides this methodological approach is geared toward understanding the bipolar design of social structure furthermore dwelling upon what she calls object relation theory hartsock sought to transcend positivism positivism which was in her analysis allegedly infused with abstract masculinity and epistemology pertaining to the sexual division of labor hartsock aspired to steer clear of the perversity of the ruling class epistemology and arrive at the experience of women one can see how marxian insight comes in play with a feminist urge to understand the everyday reality of women's life it however faces the postmodern challenge as someone like michel foucault would deem both counter discourse and hegemonic discourse as partners or as in hartsock's vocabulary oppressor ruling class and oppressed women would appear partial and perverse as with foucault so with hartsock there would be this effort to show the partiality and perversity of both the ruling class and the ruled the oppressor and the oppressed neither can come up with absolute truth claim hartsock begins by recognizing the potential partiality attached with both poles in the bipolar design of analysis however with an emphasis on object relations hartsock holds the ground that the perception of reality is formed in relation of self with other the perception of reality is not a stand alone thing either of oppressor or of oppressed instead there is it's constituted by object relations theory according to which reality is formed in relation of self with other other and self come together as far as constitution of reality is concerned oppressor and oppressed come together as far as constitution of reality is concerned and hence it is worth disclosing women's experience to know what they are what they do and what they tend to seek hartsock eventually advocates women's perspective in spite of the fact that both sides of the bipolar social structure may have 
a truth claim and each truth claim will be equally partial despite that Hartsock eventually suggests that women's experience is important however we know that reality perception of reality is constituted by the relation by by self in relation with other by oppressed in relation with oppressor and in this way Nancy Hartsock tries to create a possibility an epistemological possibility for understanding women's experience. Another important figure who does not disagree with the basics offered by Hartsock is Dorothy Smith. She does not disagree however, Smith proposed to rethink the conceptual apparatuses in sociology which tended to be abstract and opposed to the experiential embodied lived reality of women. She sought to bring about what she called Copernican shift in sociology by showing women's phenomenological everyday world in relation with Marxian or actual material settings. This makes Smith distinguishable from Alfred Schuh's phenomenology as she infused the Marxist concerns with a phenomenological interest in everyday life. But both Hartsock and Smith and others who follow the dichotomy do not tend to recognize the difference, the marked subjectivities from diverse contexts. In short, they do not recognize the plural subjectivities, the diversity and locatedness. The question of diversity of subjectivities and their locatedness is almost like a black box in this variety of feminist standpoint theory, in this variety of feminist epistemology where we do get to understand the experiential understanding, experiential knowledge lived in exp lived experience of the oppressed of women. However, we do not situate them, situate their experiences in the realm of diversity of experiences. We also do not solve the puzzle as to how diversity and locatedness can be reconciled in this framework. Because diversity and locatedness of women's experience need not sit comfortably together. This is most, most crucially identified in another feminist's attempt to understand black women's experience. Patricia Hill Collins attempt to build up a black feminist thought dwelling upon an approach of what she calls outsider within to underline the uniqueness of black women's experience distinguishable from the white counterpart. This is where with Patricia Hills Collins we begin to see the distinction of lived experience in a particular site, in a particular group, the locatedness of lived experience of women, black women comes sharply in the fore. This way of seeing employed by Patricia Hills Collins enables to suggest that oppressed women's perspective need not be absolute, need not be situated knowledge that need no amount to total knowledge and yet one need not succumb to relativism of knowledge. Situated knowledge of black women or white women may not be total knowledge, but there may be a possibility of preventing a slip into the terrain of relativism. 
Patricia Hills Collins is obviously exploring a very unique kind of possibility by dealing with diversity, by dealing with distinction of black women's experience, distinguishing it from white women's experience, showing the locatedness of women's experience and yet trying to rescue it from the realm of epistemological relativism. She attempts to redefine the idea of objectivity in relation with the location of black women and their experiences in relation with white women. The experience of black women is actually in relation with white women as well as black men and white men. While doing so, Collins deems the experiential accounts of black women relatively objective. The question of objectivity therefore does not disappear altogether in feminist standpoint theory. And on the other hand, someone like Sarah Ruddick explores maternal thinking as a feminist standpoint. This was quite interesting, maternal thinking as a feminist standpoint. She does so by dwelling upon Wittgenstein's philosophical proposition, challenging the universality of experience. The most systematic attempt to put together the ambivalence about universal truths approachable from the feminist standpoint dealing with the apprehensions of relativism is put by Sandra Harding, yet another feminist scholar. Her contribution underlines the importance of instability in feminist theories in a world that is instable. She evokes this kind of intellectual courage which would enable anyone to stay instable, to acknowledge the importance of instability in theories. Since the world at large is instable by nature, socially, politically, culturally instable world and hence theories of this, in, in, this instable world need not seek to have that finality, that absolutism. Harding goes on along this line suggesting that, that there cannot be one coherent theory of an incoherent world and hence it is imperative to adopt a postmodern standpoint approach committed to revising notions from the conventional meta theories of science. This is Harding's resolve for the seemingly irresolvable dichotomy of essentialism versus relativism, pluralism versus locatedness. Sandra's Harding's postmodern resolve might offer a great deal of excitement in terms of argument. However, it may not sit very well with a large variety of feminist thinkers. While recognizing the many ways of seeing within feminism addresses essential unity of all the oppressed voices, objective character of location vis-a-vis -vis women's lives, they take care of slip to relativism on one hand. The determination of both sides of the dichotomy could be thereby avoided. The determination of the oppressed's narrative as well as determination of the oppressor's narrative both can be avoided if it were a postmodern feminist standpoint that can embrace each side with equal ease. The possibility to be universal, essential, specific, located and lived exist together in this framework. This however does not cancel the basic tenet. The basic tenet in continuity with the conventional standpoint which underlined the importance of the accounts of the oppressed. 
the higher the level of operation, the stronger objectivity in the women's account arising from their lived experience. This is almost like a dictum. The more oppressed women are, the far more objective account would emerge from their lived experience. This idea of objectivity, however, as one can notice, departs from the masculinist science, from the science which, is, which has been allegedly masculinist in the reading of feminist scholars. The masculinist science that advocated objectivity as a way of detached narration is being overcome here in this version of objectivity offered by standpoint theory. It amounts to suggesting a middle ground between the scientific objective account based on detachment and hence fully distorted and partial and less partial and distorted account of women's lives. The less false stories, the less false stories mediate between trans historical universals and relativism, which means these partial accounts come in between trans historical universals, scientific universals which were dehistorical, dehistoricized. In order to become universal, they had to cut off any linkage with context and its history and relativism, which is entirely bound to a particular context. The feminist standpoint theory enables us to see the importance of so called partial narratives, so called false stories arising from women's lived experience. Why? Because they mediate between those trans historical detached universals those grand narratives and very, very contextual relativist narratives. Unlike the postmodernists, Sandra Harding is keen to tell less false stories of women's lives than tell one true story. Susan Heckman who was referred to in earlier lectures as well, moves ahead in solving the dilemma of recognition and difference, diversity and locatedness. The dilemma of recognition and difference which is which was which emerged as a postmodernist challenge to the feminist standpoint. Heckman tries to resolve it by suggesting that Thomas Kuhn shall be more important than Karl Marx in feminist standpoint theory. How does she do that? Steering clear of the modernist dichotomy of universal and particular, the feminist epistemology shall according to Heckman deliver a new paradigm in which politics is defined as a local and situated activity undertaken by discursively constituted subjects and likewise political resistance shall be viewed through the locally discursively constituted formation. Since there is no Archimedean point of neutral observation, it is important to explore the various discursive factors that inform observations and consequently understanding and explanations. If feminist empiricism turned from dislocated empiricism of scientific epistemology to a located contextual empiricism, feminist standpoint has arrived at the idea of successor science with a very renowned feminist scholar named Donna Haraway. A successor science which is comfortable with another story rather than truth and reality. A successor science 
which is ready to engage and understand what is considered partial truths, partial narrative. S a successor science which is not averse to the idea of listening to stories. Making radical departure from the philosopher's policing of knowledge with the weapon of objectivity, Haraway admits the contribution of social con constructivist perspective. Social constructivist perspective in feminist standpoint enables to understand the conspiracy of scientists and the parable of objectivity which scientists have offered, which scientific epistemology has cherished and nurtured and transmitted to all of us as scientific method. Who have been the victims of the scientific mythology? Haraway, with Haraway we can ask. Scientific mythology, why mythology? Because it operates with certain kind of fetishes, it operates with certain kind of values often expressed in technical jargons such as objectivity. Who is the victim of scientific mythology? Haraway notes and I quote, the only people who end up actually believing and God sake and, and God is forbid acting on the ideological doctrines of disembodied scientific objectivity enshrined in elementary textbooks and techno science booster literature are non-scientists including a few very trusting philosophers. It is quite scathing. I repeat the only people who end up actually believing and goddess forbid acting on the ideological doctrines of disembodied scientific objectivity enshrined in elementary textbooks and techno science booster literature are non-scientists including a few very trusting philosophers. This mythology of science finds legitimacy from the separation of superior totalizing from inferior relativism. This mythology appears legitimate since there is supremacy of grand narratives over others. Haraway appeals to tear through the philosophical verbiage, these are her, her words, to tear through the philosophical verbiage and unmask the dominant doctrines to fathom a feminist version of objectivity, to discover a feminist version of objectivity which would not be guided by the science, the scientific mythology which she is criticizing. This shall pave the way for Sandra Harding's idea of successor science in which ethics and politics rather than epistemology shall be prominent. In such an alternative version of science, transcendental objectivity shall be replaced by situatedness. Transcendental objectivity of science, scientific epistemology which summoned from us an overcoming of the location, the particularities, the details coming from the experience in a context bound manner. In order to become objective in exactly scientific manner, we had to transcend all these things. Whereas, the alternative version of science which feminist epistemology would support would not be bound by this transcendental objectivity. Instead, this transcendental objectivity be replaced by situatedness. Furthermore, grand narratives shall be replaced by local experiential narratives and a disembodied version, a disembodied vision shall be replaced by an embodied vision. 
feminist epistemology tries to give body and location to the experiential narratives. And the act of doing that is itself considered an objective act, an act with objectivity. In a stimulating, very stimulating discussion, Donna Haraway questions the myth of infinite vision, ability to see across the contexts and envisions I mean, these are the abilities which science ennobled. Science ennobled infinite vision, a vision which is over and above any location, which can be applicable across the globe, across the communities. This was, a, this was an ability propounded by science to see across the contexts and not be bound to any context. These are the things which appeared in the very early version of St. Simonian positivism where it was considered very good for the reconstruction of society to have visions which are over and above local context, which would be suitable, arguably suitable for contexts across the globe. This whole critical perspective seeks to envision feminism seeks to have feminist perspective on a situated vision in which separation of subject and object collapses and thus arises Haraway's feminism as another science, which, which is in her own words, the sciences and politics of interpretation, translation, stuttering and the partly understood. In feminist science, one is answerable for what one sees and the way one sees. It is not merely the fact and epistemology, but an acknowledged role of politics that feminist science encourages.